Good afternoon and welcome to another Sweet Thursday program. Today with author William Kent Kruger. Sweet Thursday is the author series sponsored by the Friends of the Lafayette Library and Learning Center, which is an all volunteer organization that sells gently used books in order to support the Lafayette Library. Thank you for joining us for another Zoom webinar. Our next program is on March 3rd, which will occur in person at the Don Tasson Community Hall at the library. Proof of vaccination and uh, masks will be required. <clears throat> we are on Zoom webinar format again, and unlike Zoom meeting, we cannot see or hear any of you. Q&A is open for you to type your questions for our author, which we will take up after the presentation please do not use the raise hand or chat features. And all of our recorded programs, including tonight's, can be viewed on our YouTube channel shown here. My name is Jeff Deaton and I'm the coordinator of the Sweet Thursday program. Ruth Thornburg will be moderating tonight's program with our guest, William Kent Kruger. We have many webinars and hopefully a few live programs scheduled in the next few months, four in March. On March 3rd, I'm excited to return to the moderating role myself for an in-person conversation with activist Saru Jayaraman about wages in the food industry as chronicled in her book, One Fair Wage, Ending Subminimal Pay in America. Um, you can register on Eventbrite. Uh, the link is shown here, and it'll also be on our weekly ad lib emails uh, if you subscribe to the library. On March 10th, we Zoom with Dr. Suzanne, Suzanne Coven and her book, Letter to a Young Female Physician. And then on March 24th, Naomi Kropitsky will discuss in person her debut novel, The Family. We also have two Wonders of the World programs scheduled, both of which will be conducted on Zoom. On March 9th, WOW and Sweet Thursday will collaborate with author Gabrielle Sells to learn about her biography of abstract painter, Sam Francis. On April uh, 13th, a docent from the De Young Museum will discuss their exhibition, Alice Peel, People Come First. Note that this program will not be recorded. If you miss a webinar, you can watch it on the Friends YouTube channel, again shown here. <clears throat> In order to learn about more library programming, you can sign up for our weekly ad libs, which uh, describe upcoming events, including those hosted by the Library Foundation and the County Library. And you can do this on the Lafayette Library and Learning Center website, LLLCF slash org, sorry, dot org slash subscribe. And for even more programming at other Contra Costa County Library branches, you can go to the county website, cccLib.org. The Friends Corner Bookshop sells inexpensive, gently used books that support all these programs at the library. I encourage you to come by and browse the shop someday. And the Amazon store of the Friends can be accessed at our tab on the library website. Once again, we thank the Friends of the Lafayette Library, the Lafayette Library County staff, the Lafayette Library Foundation, and my Sweet Thursday committee members. And Kent's book can be purchased at Orinda Books. And we can be followed on Instagram and Facebook. Today, are we are on Zoom web, oops. <laughs> Try that again. Tonight, Ruth Thornburg will lead the discussion of her author today. Uh, Ruth has served for many years on the board of the Friends, and she is a member of the Sweet Thursday Committee and a regular moderator for us. So Ruthie, it's your turn. I'm going to go off screen share if you will come on. Thank you, Jeff, and welcome everyone. 
I'm excited tonight to have William Kent Kruger here to discuss with us his latest book, Lightning Strike. Kent Kruger is an American novelist and crime writer. He's the most known for his Cork O'Connor series. These take place in Minnesota, um, mostly, um, as I said, set in Minnesota um, near the Boundary Waters. In 2005 and 2006, he won back-to-back -back Anthony Awards for Best Novel. In 2014, his standalone book, Ordinary Grace, won the Edgar Award for Best Novel of 2013. In 2019, This Tender Land was on the New York Times bestseller list for nearly six months. Um, Kent has a really interesting background, and I think I'm not going to waste a lot of time going through it. I think I'll bring him right on to talk with us, and we can kind of speak about his uh, background together. Welcome, Kent. It's really great to have you tonight. Pleasure to be with you, Ruth. How are you this evening? I'm good. So I was reading a little bit about your background, and, and uh, you're basically from the Midwest, I understand, but you did spend some time on the West Coast um, when you were young. Um, you want to talk about that just for a little bit and then sort of tell us how that experience then, you know, where did you go from there? Um, boy, what a long and winding road this is. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, my, my, um, I come from a family of uh, nomads. I think my parents really had a restless spirit. My, my father began as an English teacher. Um, and when I was born, the third of three children, ultimately there would, there would be a fourth. He, uh, he realized as an English teacher in Wyoming, he couldn't support a family. So he went into the oil business. We moved around a great deal as a result of that. Uh, ultimately ending up in Oregon when he finally decided it was time to go back to what he really loved doing, which was teaching English. Um, from there, we moved down my senior year to Manteca, which is not all that far from Lafayette. And I graduated, I spent my senior year at Manteca High and graduated from there. Uh, and uh, the following fall, I matriculated at Stanford University, where I was for uh, a year before they kicked me out. Uh, and uh, and um, since then, I have been in several different places, but for the last 40 years, I have resided in Minnesota. It has become my adopted home. Well, I think that's wonderful. And you certainly show the love of Minnesota and your stories. And um, look, that will become apparent as we talk tonight. Um, for those of you who are new to William Kent Kruger, um, this recent book that we're going to talk about tonight, The Lightning Strike, is um, a prequel to his crime series that features Cork O'Connor. Personally, I had not read any Cork O'Connor. I read Lightning Strike first, and now I am finding myself going down the road of reading quite a number of the Cork O'Connor books because I found them pretty compelling. Um, but I would like to take a step backwards, if you don't mind. Um, when I first read you, uh, or the first time I met you as an author, I read Ordinary Grace. And um, that was a very um, touching novel. I just really loved the character development. I felt like you had so much heart in how you described what was going on with the story. The two brothers that are featured, um, they definitely captured, you know, my heart. And um, so I'd like to talk about that book first because I feel like Ordinary Grace and then the step to this tender land really brought us to the point where um, our your latest book became special. So how tell me about Ordinary Grace and what it meant to you to write this book. And I'm sure, and you're absolutely right, Ruth. Uh, the road to uh, this tender land in many ways began with Ordinary Grace. There are similarities in or Ordinary Grace, the companion novel, This Tender Land, and then finally in Lightning Strike. You know, I'd, um, you know, I was best known for years and years as the author of the, what do I love saying this, New York Times best-selling Corporal Absolutely. Mystery Series, which is set up in the great Northwoods of Minnesota. Um, you know, if you were to, uh, Anybody who were to read that that series, they would see that very often in the stories, there's an undercurrent that deals with the spiritual journey. 
uh, it's something that comes very naturally from my protagonist, Cork O'Connor, because he's a man of mixed heritage. He's part Irish American and he's part Ojibwe, Anishinaabe. Um, and so he has a foot in two different spiritual traditions, this white Catholicism, this Irish Catholic, and his Ojibwe spirituality. So very often in those stories, he's trying to figure out where his unique spiritual path lies, which has been an issue for me my entire life. Uh, about 13 years ago, uh, an idea came to me that, that I thought would allow me to explore that that question more deeply, the question of the importance of the spiritual journey in our lives. Um, and, uh, and so I wrote Ordinary Grace. Uh, well, because of that, but there was also another reason. I had been looking for a very long time for a story that would allow me to go back and, and recall an important period in my own life, the summer I was 13 years old. So I wanted to, for, for a variety of reasons I won't go into, across the whole course of my life, I have vividly remembered the summer I was 13 years old. And so I wanted to go back and recall it and evoke it in such a way that I could use bits and pieces of my own life, my own experience, uh, to create the story. So the Drum family at the heart of Ordinary Grace, that's pretty much my family. The town of New Bremen is so like the small Midwestern towns where I spent my adolescence. Uh, I put... I took people out of my past and made them characters in the story. But let me, for those uh, who are uh, watching who might not be at all familiar with Ordinary Grace, let me give you the quick down and dirty on it. Oh, Ordinary okay. Grace takes place in the summer of 1961. And it's set in a, uh, in a um, small town in the very beautiful Minnesota River Valley. It's the story of a Methodist minister whose beloved child is murdered. That's the compelling mystery component. But at heart, it's really the story of what that terrible tragedy does to, to this family's faith, um, to the relationships with one another, ultimately to the fabric, the entire fabric of the small town in which they live. So, um, so Ordinary Grace really was the first real step away from pure mystery uh, that I took. And... And in the end, it opened uh, it opened the doors for so many other stories um, that now I can tell without having to worry if somebody will actually publish me. And that was a concern of yours, I understand, um, to be stepping away from the Cork O'Connor series. Um, how did your publisher feel about that? Were you encouraged, or <laughs> <laughs> how did well, that you know, work? There are there are advantages uh, and disadvantages to writing a popular long running series, and one of the disadvantages is is that um, readers may not be willing to follow you to a new place, and a publisher might not be willing to take you there. So when I first proposed uh, the project Ordinary Grace to my uh, publisher, they really didn't want it. Uh, in fact, they they called me out to New York City in kind of a panic, and sat me down and said, "Can't we really only want Cork O'Connor novels from you?" So I knew if I wrote the story, it was going to be a pretty risky proposition. But it spoke to me in such a compelling way that I knew I had to write it. So across the course of the next three years, without a contract, I composed the manuscript for Ordinary Grace. Now, even though my publisher told me they didn't want it, when I finished it, I went ahead and sent it to my editor, Simon & Schuster. She fell in love with it, and she said, of course, we're going to publish it, and they did. And, you know, Ruth, Ordinary Grace has had just this really remarkable really gratifying reception from uh, critics and readers alike. It won tons of awards when it came out. It it's been translated into more than two dozen foreign languages. So far, it's sold well over a million copies. Um, so I, both my publisher and I are very happy that I went ahead and, uh, and followed my heart. I would imagine you picked up a lot of brand new readers, too, who had not necessarily, as in my own case, um, read any of your previous work. Um, I know my first experience was through a book club group, and someone suggested the book didn't really know that much about you as an author, I read the book, and I was so intrigued, I looked into your background and realized, oh my gosh, he's, look at all these books he's written. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it was very, very enjoyable. Um, I think, you know, you, you start, you have this narrator who's this 13-year-old boy in 1961, um, and it, I don't know if you like the term coming of age, but definitely this young boy is moving from his phase as a youngster into having to address and deal with some really mature topics and subjects and so he becomes you, you watch him struggle and grow up and um, kind of 
talk about that a little bit. Is that sort of how you felt yourself as a 13 year old or were there other things about that that made you want to write in this voice? Um, it is an important time for a young, a young boy. Yeah, I, uh, as I said, I wanted to write about um, essentially where I was in my own life when I was 13 years old. And uh, for a variety of reasons, um, as I passed through that summer of, of my 13th year, I, I, I passed through a threshold. There were a lot of things that caused me to grow up uh, rather quickly. And so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to use that as the foundation for a story. Um, we all, you know, Ruth, we all go through that. We all have at, have at some point to abandon all of the wonderful naivety of our childhood and uh, and embrace often reluctantly and sadly um, the, the wisdom of, of what it is to be an adult to see the world in a, a different way um, and so I it is a topic lots of authors before me have tackled and uh, and I wasn't afraid to tackle it myself and I got to tell you I was I couldn't have it when I finished that manuscript I thought this was the story I was born to write I will never write a story as fine as this one. But then of course, this tender land came out and uh, and then uh, lightning strikes. So, hey, you know, I got a lot of pretty good stories in me, I yeah. guess. Don't say, never say never. Um, you're definitely a talented storyteller. And I think that's part of what I so enjoy about your books. I think reading the way that you tell your stories, you create this interest and this um, storyline and thread that is intriguing, but yet, it's at a, a pace that just sort of unfolds, you know, the pages in the story just keeps unfolding and it's not, you don't feel a rush to get to the end and it's not like a typical um, mystery or thriller where, you know, it's all going to come happening in the very, very end. But I just felt like the pace with which you told the story was really excellent and um, the amount of heart that you express these characters, I mean, you really become attached in many ways, and all of them. I mean, the, the parents in Ordinary Grace, the struggles that they're going through, and just the conflicts they have, all told through, again, the lens of this 13-year-old boy having to kind of come to terms with the fact that there are difficulties, and, um, you know, how he doesn't necessarily get to... Um, change how things are happening, but he certainly has to uh, learn a lot, and he is also inquisitive, so there's many things that he refuses to just accept and um, works hard to, to learn more about, so I felt like it was just really good in that manner. You know, a really fine story, Ruth, isn't about what happens, it's about who it happens to. And so as a storyteller, your first order of business is to make sure that you offer um, your readers characters that they can invest their hearts in, that they can hope for, uh, that they feel devastated uh, for when, when terrible things happen to them. You know, if you haven't got your reader on board emotionally, it's like, why read this story in the first I, Yes. But, you know, I read up many reviews people have written about you, and not, I'm not talking about, you know, the professional reviews, but just personal reviews, and people just over and again um, make that kind of statement that um, they really felt the emotionally attached to your characters, and they cared a lot about what happened, so I, I really just felt like that was, um, that was a really interesting part of the story. So, you know, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on and talk about this tender land, which um, was the second book of yours that I got to read. And that, I don't know, it was just this continuation. It's not the same story at all, but it's just the continuation of the really good character development and he's just following these kids through all the trauma they go through. And, and you introduce uh, some other elements in the story. You talk about the Indian um, children who were taken from their families. Um, I really, I did not know anything about that. I found that really um, fascinating and I appreciated, you know, you're bringing that into the story. I felt like that was something we all should know. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that and um, 
again, you've got a boy who's the narrator. He's what? Uh, Ruth, yes. uh, before we begin the discussion, let me give a down and dirty to okay, please do. who might not be familiar with this tender yeah. Uh, this Tenderland takes place in the summer of 1932, deep in the Great Depression. It's the story of four orphans running from the law because they've committed a terrible crime, but for the right reason. They know if they take to the roads to, to, to get away, they're going to be caught quickly because a huge manhunt has been launched to capture them. They're afraid to ride the rails, as everybody was doing back in the Great Depression, because the railroads back then were patrolled by private cops called bulls. And the bulls had a reputation for being incredibly cruel. So the kids are afraid to ride the rails. Instead, they decide to take to the river. Uh, they, they canoe a river called the Gilead to the Minnesota River. They canoe the Minnesota River to the Mississippi. And their plan is to canoe all the way down the Mississippi to St. Louis, where they believe they have family and they'll be safe. I have always wanted to write an updated version of Huckleberry Finn by Huckleberry Finn. It truly is an updated version of Huckleberry Finn. Um, all of the different situations these poor children find themselves in um, is kind of remarkable. I, one of the things I guess I thought about is how much they depended on themselves and each other and, you know, they were young. I mean, that, the, the oldest boy is, what, 12? No, the older brother in the book. Is He's about 16. 16. And then the youngest is the six. girl. And how old is she again? She's Emmy is six. Emmy is six. So, I mean, that is, that's a really young person to be out. Um, so what a crew they make getting through and they experience a lot of different threatening situations, but they also experience some kind humanity um, that sort of helps them on this journey. Um, but again, you're doing this is, you know, the same voice of the young boy. And I'm assuming that, you know, you're a very big part of who these voices are in your stories. Um, there must be parts of yourself as you are telling <laughs> stories um, coming to play. Is that true? Uh, absolutely, that's true. That was certainly true in uh, Ordinary Grace. Um, Frank and Jake are really representative very much of, of my older brother and me uh, and the relation. My older brother has always been my, uh, my best friend. And, uh, and so it was really easy to create that, the love between those two. In, uh, in Ordinary Grace. Uh, and uh, in this tender land, Odie O'Banion, the narrator of that particular novel, is, uh, he may be my favorite character that I've created in all of my, in all of my work because he is so much like me. Um, Odie is a storyteller, I'm a storyteller. Odie, um, Odie is a Boy Scout, I was a Boy Scout. Odie, uh, Odie is, um, he is resourceful, he is resilient, he's loyal almost to a fault, um, and he's not above stooping to a bit of larceny if the situation requires it. Been there, done that. Um, and I was able to use <laughs> both the narrative voice of Frank Drum in Ordinary Grace and Odie O'Banion's narrative voice to talk about those things that I have come to believe profoundly about life, about people, about the world, um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, invest the novel then with a lot of my own philosophy. That's really, it works. And which is much more palatable when it comes from a 13 year old kid. <laughs> okay, that's a good way to put it. Um, you have some special talents in these children. One of the, uh, the younger girls, she has this visionary kind of uh, skill or talent. Yeah. I don't know what you call it, characteristic. And, She's uh, a seer. She's what you would call a seer. And maybe even a little bit more than that, but she's a seer. Let me tell you a little bit about Emmy. She was the last of the four vagabonds uh, to come into my thinking as a vagabond. Initially, I created the character of Emmy to be a, a daughter for Cora Frost, a teacher at the uh, Native American boarding school. Um, but the, the more I wrote Emmy into the scenes that, that I created, the more I fell in love with her. And there comes a time in the story when the boys run from flee the boarding school, that all that terrible stuff that's going on at the boarding school. And, uh, and, and as I was writing that, I'm going, oh my God, they can't leave Emmy behind. 
they got to take her with them. So I had to come up with a, a role for Emmy to play as one of the vagabonds. And um, my father was a high school English teacher. And he had me, when I was young, read all of the great vision quests in literature, hero and heroine quests. And one of the things I remembered from that reading is, is that very often in a, in a uh, hero or heroine's quest, they're accompanied by a seer, somebody who can actually look into the future and offer them advice, whether it's taken or not. So I decided I was going to make Emmy my seer, which I knew was going to be kind of a stretch for a, a lot of readers. But for me, it was no stretch whatsoever because my mother was a seer. Oh. Um, yet when I was a kid, it wasn't uh, unusual at all for the phone to ring and mom would go, that's Aunt Joanne, there's trouble. And it was Aunt Joanne and there was trouble. Or she would toss and turn in bed for several nights in a row and she would say, something terrible is coming. Something terrible is coming. And sure enough, something terrible came. So making Emmy a seer was not a difficult thing for, for me to do at all. I find that fascinating, um, especially the experience having your mother have that skill and talent and uh, interesting. Um, so one of the things I was thinking about with these children, you know, it's so far from what children today get to experience. We really don't let our kids just go out and play and get into trouble and have all these experiences. And I don't know, I kind of, it made me, I guess, nostalgic, but also concerned about, you know, are the young children we're raising today, will they have these resilient coping skills that obviously these kids had to have, they had to survive. Um, so I think that's, I felt like that was sort of an interesting angle on the story. It's just a contrast. It's you know, Ruth, I gotta say, I think we sell our young people short. Um, the Great Depression certainly demanded a great deal from them. They had to grow up much sooner than any, any parent would like their child to have to grow up and face the harsh realities of life much sooner than most of us. Um, but I think, I think of uh, our young people as being incredibly resilient and incredibly resourceful. And I think if the, if the situation required it of them, we would see them um, in an entirely different light than, than we do now. But I also agree that when you and I were growing up, um, did you grow up in a small town, Ruth? I grew up in Kansas City, so okay. in the northern suburbs. So yes, so a neighborhood though. You had a neighborhood, yes. right? Yes, we had a neighborhood. And you felt you you felt comfortable being out without being escorted in that neighborhood, regardless of whether it's you know getting dark or anything, right? Right. We had certain times mothers would just open the door and yell out the backyard, and some kid would yeah. just say, "You have to go home." So yeah. Yeah, you know, I've had a lot of people say, "Oh, well, for us, it, you know, you know how it was in the summer. You would get up, you'd have breakfast, you'd take off." No, your parents wouldn't say, where are you going? You know, you came back at lunch and you took off after lunch. Your parents wouldn't say, where are you going? They didn't worry about you. And uh, come back for dinner. Then you go out and everybody had sort of whatever their signal was to come back at the end. Uh, the street lights went on or they sent the family dog or, you know, whatever it was. And, the, and they came back and nobody worried about it. When in truth, if you remember your childhood, we were probably doing a lot of things. <laughs> that if our parents knew we were doing them, they would have worried like crazy. Yeah, there was definitely some danger out there, um, but the freedom was pretty amazing, and it yep. was fun. And yep. uh, we would pack that bologna sandwich and just be gone. We'd be gone till dinner because we'd just pack a lunch. But um, very fun, and and definitely, I think that also just that aspect that you bring into the story takes me back to my youth, and um, so it's a fun thing to share. And you know, I really appreciate you bringing that into the story. Um, so you have a lot, your characters and your ability to describe things, you, you show a lot of compassion, you show a lot of heart. Um, there, I just feel like this is, must be an integral part of who you are as a person. And it made me think, boy, you'd be a great person to sit around a campfire with and uh, <laughs> be able to you know, share stories and just learn more about you know, your view on life. Um, but anyway, I, I'm feeling like that's a big part of who you are as a person. You know, Ruth, I hope someday you and I have a chance to sit down together over a little bit of wine and I'll tell you all about myself. Okay, that would be great. Um, I have another question though. So going down those rivers, can you talk about what kind of research you may have done to prepare for writing that? I, you know, I felt very vivid 
um, I felt like the experiences the kids had was, you know, pretty true to life. So how did you prepare for that? Yeah, yeah, I'm one of those authors who believes as much as possible, you have to experience what it is that you write about. And you should never write about a place that you haven't been. Um, in terms of writing about things that you've experienced in my Cork O'Connor series, I draw the line at murder. Okay. I'm not there yet. Uh, but, but pretty much everything else I write about, I, you know, I try to have that experience. I've had that experience so that I can write about it in, in a realistic, very sensual way, you know, so that I can bring in all of my senses. So for the, um, for this tender land, I kayaked that section of the Minnesota river that the kids kayak. And my wife and I together canoed that section of the Mississippi that the kids canoe in the story. Um, everywhere that I had the kids stop, I visited so that I could actually uh, draw on real landmarks to, in my own thinking, in the creation of the scenes that I put in the story. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was there. I did that. That's neat. That's really cool. Well, let's talk about Lightning Strike, because this is your most recent. And um, again, another very successful um, book, if you in terms of my own opinion, um, another young boy narrating the story. And um, this, so as I said, I had not read the Cork O'Connor stories before reading Lightning Strike. So in reading this, um, we learn a lot about all of the um, early days for Cork O'Connor. Um, what it's like for him growing up in this town. He is um, part, uh, Indian as well as part, you know, his father is Irish Catholic or Irish. Um, and Irish Catholic. Irish Catholic. So, it, you know, the, he goes to the Catholic Church, but there's also a lot of guidance from the reservation people in his life. So he has that level of spirituality as well. Um, but in the very opening scenes, he and his buddy come upon um, a gruesome scene and Again, we have this 12-year-old boy who now has a lot of growing up to do. And um, I think, you know, you're kind of a natural in that place and voice. So, uh... <laughs> you know, I have to tell you, Ruth, I'm a firm believer that men never really mature much past 13 years of age. So it was really easy for me to capture the voice of an adolescent male. That's great. Well, and, you know, in this book, it's really focuses more on the father son relationship. And um, his father is in law enforcement, he's the sheriff, and he gets involved in the investigation. And I just felt like the relationship between Cork and his father um, was also another, you know, developing experience. And you could see this young boy growing up but you could also see the father struggling with how much to let him grow up you know but he I felt like the father always um erred on the side of truth and it, again on this book if you want to give us a little background uh for the audience that might be worth doing sure the story um the real story opens there's a prologue but the real story opens as you have indicated when Cork O'Connor and his good friend Jorge um, are headed out to a place called Lightning Strike um, on a hike for their, because they're Boy Scouts, they have to, they're, they're trying to get their hiking merit badge. And so they're gonna hike out to Lightning Strike, which is a sacred area to the uh, Anishinaabe, uh, the Ojibwe. Um, and when they get there, they discover uh, a, a gruesome death uh, of a man that Cork has a native man that Cork has greatly respected. The white population see the death in one way, the Ojibwe population see the, the death in an entirely different light. And it's that conflict of, of different versions or different ways of seeing an event, trying to decide what's true based on your cultural differences. Uh, <laughs> which is so abroad in the world today. Really is. Um, and so it's the story of Cork trying to understand um, what really happened. Also trying to understand, this is a coming of age. Yet again, a coming of age. I love it though. 
so well done. <laughs> so Cork, Cork O'Connor at, uh, at 12, 13 years of age in this story has lived his life seeing himself and his family in one way. But as a result of this death, he becomes aware that the community sees him because he's of mixed heritage, his father, because he married a woman who is half Ojibwe, and his mother, uh, because she is half Ojibwe, very differently than the, the rest of the white population see each other. He becomes aware that there are epithets that are thrown at them that he hasn't been aware of before. And so he has to try to, to understand, okay, now who am I? Um, how do I embrace everything that I am? Um, and that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. And when you look at, do you know, one of the things I liked about this story, I have been both a son and a father. And so I could see, I could see everything that happened from both sides of the issue. Cork wanting to have more freedom to investigate, to help, to find the truth. And his father, a father fearful for his son in a situation that could turn volatile. Um, and that was, I loved that conflict, that um, the concern on both sides, father and son. But, you know, it's not just father and son. This is also, it's, it's not just an exploration of the relationship Cork and his father have. It's also a, an exploration of the relationship Cork had with his mother, the relationship his parents had with one another. All of these important relationships that help shape Cork into the man who occupies center stage in this long running series of mine. Yeah, the um, scenes where he climbs out his bedroom window and sits sort of where he can hear what his parents are saying. He does a lot of eavesdropping. And, you know, that's how a lot of kids learn. You, it's not that your parents sit down and talk to you, but you overhear them and it makes you question and wonder and try to figure out what's going on. Um, there's also because you only hear as a child, you only hear those bits and pieces. And so you're trying to put, you're trying to pick together the whole story from these fragments that, um, that aren't shared with you, but you have found a way to, you know, uncover. Kids are so intuitive. And I think, you know, Cork kind of shows that where he knows when he needs to climb out the window and pay attention. He can tell by the tone. He can tell by just the tension in the room, you know, what's, that there's something going on that he needs feels like he needs to know about. So um, he's quite clever and um, definitely knows how to read the situation. Um, I think, you know, the, as you talked about the, the rift between the um, reservation and um, the rest of the town is one situation, but then you have this family, as you've described, and they sort of have one foot in the reservation and one foot in the community, the white community. And so they're not really 100% either, which is a totally different uh, situation to be in because you're not fully accepted in either place. I think with the father, with Liam, the, I mean, yes, he's married to a woman who is part Indian, but he even struggles with himself, you know, that he has his Irish um, Catholic background, is that keeping him from seeing the whole picture as he should be? He starts questioning himself a little bit. Um, but yeah, that... let, let, if I could, let me talk about the, the issue of the conflict in the family, because one of the things that I wanted to explore here was the whole nature of the of conflict. You know, when you're a, a writer, here we go, uh, writing 101. When you're a writer of, of, or a storyteller, what is it that you're looking for? You're looking for conflict because it's conflict that drives great stories. What is it that drives uh, Romeo and Juliet? It's the conflict between those powerful families, the Capulets and the Montagues, in which our star-crossed lovers find themselves caught. Um, Moby Dick, Ahab and that white whale, conflict, conflict, conflict. And so when I was considering the story, I realized conflict is going to be just really rich in, uh, in this story I'm gonna create because you have the, con the conflict between the white population and the Ojibwe population, but you also have all this conflict within the O'Connor household because Grandma Dilsey, um, Cork's mother, Cork's grandmother is in fact true blood Ojibwe. Her daughter Colleen is half Ojibwe. So Colleen feels a 
really has a foot in two different traditions profoundly. And she has a husband who is an Irish cop and who sees things in a very concrete um, Euro way. Um, and so she's trying to mediate between Liam, her husband, who sees things in one way, and her mother, Grandma Dilsey, who sees things in an entirely different way. And then Cork is caught in all of this conflict, trying to figure out what side of this he's on. It, it was so much fun writing that. <laughs> Well, I have fun reading it. Uh, the other character that I'm really intrigued with is Henry Malou. Could you talk about him and his great importance, not just in this story, but um, he's a younger man and, you know, in this series, I've, now that I'm reading some of the other books, he just still continues to be a very important presence. Um, yeah, Henry Malou, Henry Malou is the uh, closest thing I write to a stock character, the wise old medicine man. Um, Malou, as I'm writing him in the series now, the contemporary series, he's 105 years old. Wow. Um, he, he is a member of the Grand Medicine Society. He's a midi, a healer. Um, he's, he is, in fact, wise. He's compassionate. He's, uh, he's courageous. He's funny. Um, but I've tr you know, <laughs> tried to make him as believable as I can. So he farts a lot, as old people do. Uh, me among them. Um, and he... You know, I, he is a, almost always now at the center of a Cork O'Connor novel because he is Cork's spiritual mentor. Uh, he's the guy that Cork turns to when everything is so knotted up, he, he has no idea what the hell is going on. But Henry really handles it in, a, in an interesting way. He never gives Cork an answer. He typically will present Cork with a, um, a riddle or he'll typically suggest a direction for Cork to follow as he does in Lightning Strike, follow the crumbs he keeps yes. telling Cork, but he doesn't tell him what those crumbs are. Um, and it, when Cork solves the riddle or when he follows that trail of crumbs, he goes to the place Malou always knew he would end up. Um, and so I, you know, I, I do dearly love writing Malou. He is, uh, many, many, many readers have written and told me, He's their favorite character in the story. And I certainly understand that. But in Lightning Strike, he's a young 60 year old guy, you know? Oh. Oh. And then there's um, Sam Wintermoon, who also has a very important relationship with both Cork and his father. Yeah, Sam Wintermoon is, uh, is a man who, uh, he's Ojibwe, but he, uh, operates commercially in pretty much a white world because he has opened a hamburger joint uh, in an old Quonset hut. And so he, uh, he really does straddle quite well both worlds, although he is of uh, full blood Ojibwe. He is uh, Liam O'Connor, Cork's father. He is a good friend. Uh, they both shared war experiences and that has, you know, and has had a, a bonding effect for them. And so Sam is a good friend, and as much as he can, he helps Cork, but there comes that point when he, you know, he says, essentially, I can't help you anymore because I'm Ojibwe, and you're white, and you're asking all the wrong questions. Yeah, asking them in the wrong way, and the wrong questions. Um, you know, it's very, it does get very tense between the two communities, and I think that's a you know, strong part of the story. Um, it's fun to talk about a book and not give it away, but you know, <laughs> it's also somewhat hard. Um, well, we no haven't given away any of the essential mysteries yeah. or how those mysteries are, because there, there are a couple of very profound mysteries at work here. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. there are a couple of profound deaths that occur and are of a mysterious nature. Yes, and they definitely keep you turning the page. There's no question about that. Um, so. I would like to, there, there was one line where Cork is describing his, what's going on in his feelings and he says, you know, he feels like his world is crumbling. And I think that's sort of a, a pivotal point for him where, and when I read that, I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, this poor boy, he is really having to face so much. Um, but I, I felt like that term his world is crumbling, is really vivid. And now, let me, ask, but let me ask you a question, Ruth. Okay. Um, in your own life, in your adolescence, weren't there 
wasn't there at least one time and probably many when you went, oh God, the world is just, it just sucks. Everything is not the way it's supposed to be. Sure, overwhelming and just, you know, so many new, well, not new, but just um, things you were just felt protected from. And then all of a sudden the world becomes much more apparent. And, and particularly when it affects your family, you know, yeah. your family is your, uh, that's your comfort. That is where you feel safe. Yeah. And when it's your family that's being threatened, when it looks like your family is in fact uh, in, in jeopardy of falling apart, oh my God, imagine how that feels. And that's yeah. where work is. So um, I hope that our listeners are intrigued by your three stories. And I know um, I feel they're definitely rereaders. I have gone through Ordinary Grace more than once. My um, book club read it and then my husband and I went on a car trip and we listened to the book and the audio book is also quite great but I think it's even knowing what was going to happen I thoroughly enjoyed it that second time through so that's that's the um testament of a really good story um, well thank you I appreciate that oh it's, it's great um I just thought I'd ask a couple of questions in general about you and then we'll turn it over and, and get Jeff back on and we can answer our audience questions um are you currently reading anything right now that we would like to talk about? Or who do you like to read? Uh, well, most of my reading these days, Ruth, um, are what are called ARCs, Advanced Readers Copy okay. or Bound Galleys. These are uh, novels that you won't see on the bookshelves in your bookstore for many, many months, sometimes as much as a year. But I've been asked to read them in order to give a dust jacket quote. You know, you've seen sure. on the front of a, a book, Stephen King says, this is the best thing since the Bible. Well, when I broke into the business, uh, established writers were willing to do that for me. And it's a way that we, we pay back. So uh, if I talked about the books I'm reading now, it wouldn't mean anything to you because you'll have forgotten them eight months from now. Uh, but I'll tell you, I lead a book group for my, uh, for my church. I have for about a quarter of a century now. And uh, the book that we're going to be discussing on Sunday uh, that we just, uh, I just finished reading is a book called um, My Family and Other Animals. It's by uh, Jerry Durrell. Um, if you've watched on PBS, the series, The Durrells of Corfu. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. This, is, this is the first book of the three books that in which uh, Jerry, Gerald uh, Durrell, Jerry, um, chronicles the life of his family on Corfu. And it's just, it's one of the most delightful books I've read in a long time. If you want something uplifting and funny, read uh, my, my Family and Other Animals. Okay, that sounds great. Um, and who would you say it has influenced you as far as a writer goes? You know, in terms of my mystery work, certainly uh, a writer named Tony Hillerman, a mystery writer named Tony Hillerman, uh, for those readers out there who don't know that name, uh, Tony Hillerman uh, was an icon in the mystery genre. He wrote a series that was uh, set in the Four Corners area of the Southwest and dealt, that dealt significantly with the, the Navajo people, the culture of the Diné. Uh, when I discovered Hillerman, um, I just was blown away by profound sense of place, just marvelous sense of place, wonderful characters. And he was able to weave these uh, just these fascinating Navajo um, cultural elements into his stories, which is one of the reasons I do what I do with the Ojibwe here in Minnesota. So um, uh, Hillerman definitely, um, it, stylistically probably Steinbeck, um, Steinbeck, particularly when he was talking about the Salinas Valley, his sense of place is just marvelous. You could see his love of that place in every line that he wrote. And I feel that way about Minnesota. So I try to invest my writing with the same heart. Uh, let's see who else, um, you know, Hemingway very early on, my father had me read Hemingway and I felt very, I, I fell in love with the guy. What I, what I really fell in love with was that mythic image of Ernest Hemingway. So I don't like, write like Hemingway, but uh, he certainly inspired me to want to become a writer. I'm going to ask Jeff to come back on, and if Robin's still with us, we can go through some of the questions that are coming in. I know people have um, interest, and then we'll see where we go. Jeff, welcome. All right. Good job, guys. We have a few. I'm going to combine one. It's, um, can you tell us about your interest in Native American culture and spirituality? And similarly, where did your... Uh, Native American experience and knowledge come from? 
I'll have to be uh, quite honest. Um, I, I, my interest in the Ojibwe here particularly uh, began in a very, for a very mercenary reason. Um, when I decided that, after reading Hillerman that, uh, you know, nobody's writing mysteries uh, using the Ojibwe here in Minnesota. Maybe I should do that. Um, I, I thought, okay, um, let's do that. But the truth is at that point in time, I knew about the Ojibwe almost as much as every other white person knows about the native cultures that we live shoulder to shoulder with nothing. But I was a cultural anthropology major in college. And so the idea of learning about this culture, not my own, was an exciting proposition. So I began in the way all good academics begin. I began by reading. Um, and in the course of my research, I began to meet members of the Ojibwe culture, uh, form relationships that have over all these years become important friendships for me. So my, it all began with that, the decision to write stories that included the Ojibwe um, in my, in my work. Um, the result really has been just an incredibly profound admiration and deep respect for uh, the culture of the Ojibwe and in Southern Minnesota, the culture of the uh, Dakota. Um, these are rich cultures, they're complex cultures, they're ancient cultures. Uh, these are people who, despite the fact that, uh, you know, our ancestors did everything they could to eradicate them from this continent, here they are. And then they, despite all of the challenges they face, they are working very hard to maintain their culture, to maintain their, their language. Um, I, I so greatly respect them. And they haven't lost their sense of humor. You know, there's so much to love about <laughs> our native brothers and sisters. And you know, if you, if you are going to include um, a native people in your, in your work, it includes their spirituality because that's a profound part of their culture. Okay, um, this one might be funny. Is it just curious after reading Lightning Strike, what is the rela your relationship with your mother-in-law? <laughs> Grandma Dilsey is not my mother-in-law. <laughs> Although there are probably, you know, ooh, Jeff, I never thought about this before. There are probably similarities. Uh, my, my mother-in-law was uh, uh, a woman of uh, pretty strong opinions and, uh, and she could tell you exactly what she thought about you and about other people, about things, if uh, she felt strongly about them. Um, and she was also uh, pretty erudite in, her, uh, in the way she talked. So yeah, never thought about that. But I loved her dearly. She, has, she passed away many years ago, but I loved her dearly. I have a question for both you, Kent, and maybe Ruthie, too. Do you think your mystery book should be read in order, or does it make any difference? I mean, Rudy, Ruthie's sort of reading them backwards. <laughs> oh, I started with this one, but then I've gone back to the beginning. Yeah. So I started. Is, I read is that the most book. fun, to start at the beginning, or start? Yes. Or does it matter? I think it matters. Yeah, you know so do I. I. Yeah, I think it matters, because... Things happen, I mean, these things happen. So here's why it matters. Here's why it matters to me, and I think it matters to readers. The 17 books in the series prior to uh, uh -oh. Strike span 15 years in the lives of the characters involved. When I began that series, I saw Corporal Connor as a man approximately 40 years of age. Now I'm writing him as a man in his mid 50s. His children, were you know very young in the early books now they're adults they have they have lives of their own cork is a grandfather um so if you begin at the beginning and you read through an order it's a richer experience because you see the changes you see the how the how the aging changes how the relationships change how they see one another different how they see themselves different um so i i always recommend that you read them in order that said any writer of a long running series understands that a reader might come to your work in the 12th or the 14th or the 16th book. So you have to make sure that every story stands alone. It has to be satisfying within the covers of that particular book. It can't rely on a reader's understanding of the history involved in all of these characters. So if readers come to, to my work in the, the 15th book, that's fine. But I always hope that they are so intrigued that they wanna go back to the beginning 
and read the others. Yeah. Someone has made a chat and said, Aurora seems like the most dangerous small town in the US. <laughs> I love Wait a minute. I, ha I have one more. I have another town that's even more dangerous. Oh, okay. Cabot Cove. Cabot Cove. Uh, yes. <laughs> You're Murder, right. she wrote. Yeah. Those people died like crazy. <laughs> so here's the deal. Here's the deal. You know, when you, um, when you write a mystery, you have this contract that you and the reader agree on. And the contract goes like this. As a writer, I will promise that I will give you a world, even though it's not real, that feels very real to you. I will make it as real as possible. Then you as a reader are willing to suspend those elements that require some disbelief, like the population of Aurora being decimated because <laughs> so many people die there. Okay, the other thing that um, I felt like was a small little thing, but I loved it. You've got the town of Aurora and then you have the Borealis sisters. So have you seen the Northern Lights up there? Where you who, who living in Minnesota hasn't seen the Northern Lights? I don't know. It's but... one of the great benefits of living here. Is I have good? seen the Northern Lights in, in a way that just, you know, as I'm watching them, I'm going, okay, God, you can take me right now because nothing could be more beautiful than this. Wow. Okay, that's I, it's on my list of uh, things I want to do in my life. So I guess I'm going to have to come to Minnesota. So um, can someone is asking, are is this book good for teenagers? Absolutely, I think this is a book that uh, that a, a precocious um, middle grader could probably read. There's nothing in it that is. Um, there's no objectionable language. There's no uh, overt violence. Um, and I do that, I do that um, um, consciously because my books are on recommended reading lists here in the schools in Minnesota. Okay. So I don't want to alienate uh, any of my readership. And, you know, young, young people read my books and grandparents read my books. I have a broad uh, demographic in my readership. So I don't want to alienate anybody. And I think this would be just a, a really good, fun story for um, a, even a precocious uh, middle grader to read. Oh, that's good. How about other questions? Uh, there's one here. It says, is there a good story about how you got kicked out of Stanford? <laughs> oh, I love answering this question. Yes, here's the Stanford story. I matriculated at Stanford in the fall of 1969. Um, if you remember this, if you remember that period of time, those of you are old enough, we were deeply in, in, involved in the Vietnam conflict, which was a terribly divisive uh, situation for our for our nation. It divided uh, divided communities. It divided families. In the spring of 1970, while I was at Stanford, uh, that was the spring of the shootings on the Kent State uh, campus by the uh, the National Guard. There, it was also in that spring that we learned that not only were we carrying out a war in Vietnam. We were secretly bombing Cambodia and Laos as well. Um, Stanford at that point in time had a, a relationship with an organization called the Stanford Research Institute, SRI, whose primary source of income at that point in time was research into military weaponry. Uh, and there were a lot of us at Stanford who felt that that was an inappropriate relationship for an institution like Stanford to maintain, particularly at that point in history. So we petitioned the, the trustees to sever the relationship. We petitioned the administration. We marched. We demonstrated. Nobody listened to us because, of course, there were huge sums of money involved. And finally, in frustration, a group of us one day marched into the administration building and we, we took over the president's office. Uh, the, the president at that point, a guy named Richard Lyman, was very reasonable. He said, I'm not going not gonna to give any problem. He vacated the building and we took it over. About eight o'clock that night, we had a band come in and we held a dance where typically everybody would have been registering for classes. And at midnight, the band uh, packed up and, and took off. And those of us who were going to occupy the building rolled out our sleeping bags. Huge tactical error because at 1 a.m. the Palo Alto riot squad swept through and arrested us. I was on a full scholarship to Stanford. Uh, it evaporated and uh, that was my last year there. That is a good story. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I have to tell you, I have always thought it was far more interesting to say that I was kicked out of Stanford than I graduated from the place. <laughs> Well, let's see, there's one more question it looks like. Let's see what we have here. If you co-wrote a book with Louis, oh, Louise Erdrich, 
what would it look like? I, neither of us would ever agree to that uh, okay. because both of us are so, uh, we have such different voices. I would never do it because Louise is in fact Ojibwe. She's Anishinaabe. Yeah. She has an authentic Ojibwe voice. I have no native blood in me whatsoever. I'm painfully aware that I'm a white guy trespassing on a culture, not my own. I write a particular kind of story that really appeals more to um, a white readership, I have to be honest. Um, and uh, so it'll never happen. But I love her and I love her work. Okay. Well, Kent, I'm gonna have to tell you, this has been quite a pleasure. I really <laughs> enjoyed the opportunity. I hope someday when we get to back to doing these things in person and you write another book, you'll stop by to see us when you're in Northern California because it would be- You know, I often, uh, I often visit uh, Book Passage uh, oh. at that store. Okay. Uh, I'm in the San Francisco area. Um, and I try to hit it with every book, but uh, we don't know. I have a new book coming out in August, but we'll have to see. So tell us, what it, is it a Cork O'Connor or what is it? It's a Cork O'Connor. I bring Cork back up to the present today. Um, it's called Fox Creek uh, and it will release, I think, August 23rd. Okay, well, we're going to keep an eye on your calendar because if we see you coming to the West Coast, we're going to try to get you in person. I think it would be a real treat. Um, That's that sounds wonderful to me, Ruth. <laughs> okay. And Ruth, I have to say, you've just been delightful to talk to. Thank oh, you. Yeah, thank you very much. It's just really been a pleasure. So we look forward to the next time. Continued success on your series and whatever else you um, undertake. We just do nothing but encourage all this good work from you. So thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight. Really appreciate the time. And Kent, we'll talk soon, I hope. Yes. Right. Thank, thank you very you much, Karen. Thank you, Ken. Good luck. Uh, yeah. It's great.